Ah, the Caribbean. From watching my channel or related content, you might be familiar with this strange slice of earth. It was a land in constant change. Borders were drawn and redrawn on maps which were never too accurate in the first place. You see, these islands were very much dynamic. Rapidly rising sea floors, low-lying islands and shallow reefs made them difficult to navigate, even to the most experienced pilots. It is a maritime landscape home to countless shipwrecks. Ships like the Widder Galley, Queen Anne's Revenge and Maravillas. Yet, historians are continuously frustrated over the lack of one type of shipwreck. They haven't found any sloops. Sloop. It is a simple name for a simple vessel. A sailboat. A hull with a deck and a single mast. A sloop. The lack of shipwrecks might indicate that the sloop was never used. Yet, we continuously encounter it in period documents. It was a favorite among merchants and pirates alike. In his book, Under the Black Flag, David accordingly examined written evidence for colonial pirate attacks conducted between 1715 and 1730 and concluded that 55% were conducted in sloops. Sloops were used by famous pirates like John Rackham, Bartholomew Roberts, Charles Vane and Blackbeard. In cinema and video games, we often see Blackbeard's final stand imagined as an epic duel between large ships. In reality, it was a running fight between sloops. The sloop was a vessel tailored perfectly for the Caribbean. It was built for speed, yet it never sacrificed its cargo capacity, making it perfect both for merchants and for pirates. It could sail up shallow waters, reefs, swamps and rivers, allowing the sloop to hide, pursue, flee, everything you need for a get-rich-quick scheme. It required a small crew to handle, as few as five men, but pirates could easily overcrowd them with up to 90 men meaning less work for everyone and a numerical advantage in combat. In tropical seas, wooden ships need their lower hull cleaned four times a year. Otherwise it will become infested with barnacles and shipworms. The former will slow you down, the latter will turn the hull into Swiss cheese. No, 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 no. This process, called careening, was best done in a shipyard, which were rare in the Caribbean and definitely unavailable to pirates. At the best they had an isolated beach, where it was much easier to overhaul a light boat like the sloop, compared to a ship. The longer you stopped for repairs, the more time you gave the navy a chance to catch you. And if your sloop was beyond repair, well, capture a new one. Everyone used them, they were freely available to capture and commandeer. And as a merchant, they were highly replaceable, owing to their cheap cost. Bermuda had become the sloop building capital of the Americas. The local landholders made collective investments in sloop construction, harvested local wood and utilized unpaid labor, slavery. Unlike the slaves in other colonies who were used for mining or plantation work and similar assignments, the Bermudans trained their slaves to be craftsmen, carpenters and boat builders. The sloop is featured and playable in several pirate games like Sid Meier's Pirates and Sea of Thieves. I will be analyzing their implementation in the last part of this video, but if you want to get your own hands on these games, I'd recommend you check out Instant Gaming. They offer games at incredibly steep discounts. Let's take a look. Sid Meier's Pirates, boom, 87% off. Sea of Thieves, boom, 57% off. Assassin's Creed, boom, 85% off. As I've said earlier, I would only ever accept sponsorships from products I can personally vouch for, and Instant is always where I buy my games. And if you don't want to buy something, you can click the second link in the description to enter their monthly giveaway and get a chance at winning a game for free. But if you do buy something, you'll get a great discount, support my channel and instant gaming. Thank you so much and have fun. The sloop as we know it seems to have appeared first in the 1680s. It was an amalgamation of older models like the Dutch sloop, confusing, I know, the shallop, the yacht, the Bermuda boat, and no doubt, countless more. In fact, before 1680, sloop was used to denote a variety of different vessels. You might hear the word cutter in association with sloops and pirates. It denotes a type of rigging which was common on sloops, but the name is anachronistic. It did not come about until the late 18th century. You might have heard of the Jamaica sloops. Ever since the English conquest in 1655, 
Jamaica became famous for its production of sloops. The word seems to have been vernacular, and denoted a variety of small vessels with similar characteristics, but different hulls and riggings. We have no illustrations or descriptions defining them for sure. In 1744, a Jamaica-class sloop was designed by the Royal Navy, but it was a different project from the grassroots constructions of the previous century. Aside from the shared name, we simply cannot confirm the connection. It was the same in Europe. In the Royal Navy, sloop referred to any light support craft, carrying less than 20 guns. But this is something I have to tackle in a separate video. Of course, even in the Americas, some sloops diverged from the common design. For example, some early schooners were called sloops. But historians agree that most of them followed the design of my presentation. I've patched together this design from several illustrations, descriptions and ship plans dating between 1680 and 1740. From what I could discern, very little changed. Of course, shipbuilding in the period was primarily done by the rule of thumb and the whim of the shipwright, so no vessel would have been the exact same. Sloops also varied slightly from region to region. Whilst we might be unable to tell the difference, a period sailor could do this instantly. We're gonna start out with the hull, and then move on to the rigging. Let's start by looking at the sloop in profile. She can be distinguished as a sloop from several patterns. She has a flat stern, and a deeply raked stern post. The stem post, or front of the hull, is rounded. She has a sharp rise in floors, this is the curvature here in the back. I will also add the waterline to this profile. As you can see, the sloop had a very low freeboard, how much of it uh, sits above the water. This reduced additional weight and also made it a smaller target for cannon fire. Now let's look at the hull from a cross section. The two distinguishing marks are the rounded bilge and the top sides, which on a sloop were either straight or more interestingly, flared. Here's the sloop from the top. As you can see, she is almost shaped like a fish with a rounded head and body that tapers abaft and terminates in a flat stern. Now let's go inside of the sloop. A 1741 ship plan of the Mediator, a sloop built in Virginia, gives us a good insight into what most sloops would have looked like below deck. The hull would not have been deep enough for an orlop, and would only have housed a cargo hold and a bilge below it. The hold of the Mediator seems to have been about 9 feet in height, but most sloops would have had a lower hold, but no less than 5 feet. The back of the hold could then have been divided into compartments for specific goods. Many sloops had their great cabin fitted in the back of the hold, with windows, called lights, located on the upper deck. The cabin was accessed via the companionway hatch and ladder. The plan for the mediator shows the breadroom astern, the magazine below and in front, and a hallway between them to access both. This hallway would have been a good placement for the cockpit, or surgeon's quarters. The mediator plan also shows the fire hearth, or ship's kitchen, as located amidships, just behind the mast, you access the hold via a large hatch located amidships. The best sloops were built on Bermuda and Jamaica, using native Caribbean cedar. The benefit of cedar was that it made the sloop lighter and more resilient to shipworms. The high resin content gives the wood a bitter taste, which the worms find unpalatable. Thus, a cedar boat had a lifespan of up to 40 years in the Caribbean, whilst an oaken hull had like 10. The reddish-brown hue of the cedar would also have given them a distinct look. However, many sloops were painted. A deposition from 1729 described the Rhode Island sloop as follows. A blue stern, two cabin windows, her counter painted yellow with two black ovals, her sides painted yellow, her moldings were all white. The size of the cedar tree did limit the size of the sloop. Most Bermuda sloops were between 40 to 50 feet in length, had a maximum width of between 13 to 20 feet, and a draft between 5 to 9. Most of them weighed between 5 to 40 tons, with 20 ton sloops being the most common. However, between 1710 and 1740, Bermuda began importing foreign timber. This allowed them to construct larger sloops, some of which weighed over 100 tons. The shape of the hull also varied on its purpose. A sloop built for trading wine would have had a rounder hull, whereas a privateer may have been slimmer. Now let's look at some additions to the basic hull. 
sloops were often flushed, that is, the deck was flat from stem to stern. Others had an after castle added to them. These might just be a small cabin at the back. Others had a steerage ahead of the cabin. The helm, the steering device, could then have been placed on the quarter deck or safely inside of the cabin or steerage. Early sloops were steered with a tiller. After 1715, larger sloops may have had ship wheels. Since the keel of the Bermuda sloop was deeper at the stern, it had excellent rudder control. Some sloops were fitted with a head, a curved platform which was used to control the head cells and also as a toilet. Some of these may have terminated in a figurehead, but it would have been too expensive and unnecessary for most sloops. At the bow of the sloop you also had a windlass, used for lifting the anchor and heavy cordage. Just the fore of the helm stood the biticle, which is a glass housing for the compass. Ahead of it stood the two pumps, which were connected to the bilge and used for pumping out water. Depending on their size, sloops could be armed with between 2 to 12 cannon. These would have been light pieces, 3, 4 and 6 pounders. More common would have been to use swivel guns. One Bermuda sloop was recounted as having 10 guns and 12 swivels. Virtually all small ships in the New World were equipped with oars. These were 30 feet in length and stuck out of square holes called oar ports. Small merchants might only have two oars for maneuvering in harbors, whereas men of war, pirates and privateers could have had between 7 to 12 oar ports on each side. Moving on to the rigging, most sloops were equipped with only a single mast but a few of them had two and were rigged like brigs, brigantines or schooners. Whilst we today usually refer to ship types by their rigging, in the 17th century the hull type was more important. But for the sake of simplicity, I'm only going to discuss the most common sloop rig in this video, which was a single mast and a bowsprit. This type of rigging definitely seems borrowed from the yacht, which was a Dutch vessel used for trading, patrolling, cruising and yes, pleasure. English royalty adopted it for the latter purpose and here we are today. Sloops outside of the Bermuda design had a straight mast. The mast had a boom extending over the stern, rigged with a large gaff mainsail, the sloop's primary mode of propulsion. Two triangular headsails were then added onto the bowsprit. Bermuda sloops had a raked mast, meaning it was leaning 15 degrees off vertical. The raking gave it a roguish look and its profile looked like a swordfish on the prowl. A raked mast shifted the center of gravity back along the keel and allowed the sloop to be equipped with extra headsails without fear of driving the head under. Thus, we see Bermuda sloops equipped with up to three headsails. And yes, headsails, mainsails, etc. are pronounced mainsail, headsail, etc. The bowsprit was aligned at 90 degrees to the mast, which made it less vulnerable during high seas. It also kept out the water when the vessel was heeling forward and over with the wind. The bowsprit could be further extended with a jib boom. Some bowsprits had a spritsail added to them, which are square sails found below. There was also a sprit topmast, used for flying the foremost flag, called the jack. Going back to the mainmast, it was common to fit out the sloop with a large main course. The mast could be further extended with a topmast and a topsail added to it. This would have been the maximum amount of sail for most sloops, but some of them, the largest I reckon, could have had a togallant mast with a togallant sail, and even stunsails running out to the sides. Stunsails are some of my favorite shipboard technology. These are smaller sails which run out on smaller yards extending from the yard arms of the main yard, only used in heavy winds. All of these sails could be taken down or deployed to accommodate for any wind conditions. Sails were kept in the sail locker, and some even carried additional sails like ring sails, boom sails, and water sails. And that should cover what most sloops in the period would have looked like. While small, the sloop was incredibly seaworthy. The addition of topsails and gallants made it excellent for deep water voyages, and it even allowed the Bermudans to go beyond the Americas and across the Atlantic. Bermuda sloops were sold to countries like Spain and Portugal, they were used in the slave trade. English merchants called them plantation built, since they were built by slaveholders on Bermuda using slave labor for bringing in additional slaves. One of these sloops could be of only 25 tons, yet carry as many as 70 slaves. 
another was even smaller. It weighed 11 tons and could take on board a mere 30 slaves. Thomas too was the first pirate to bring a Bermuda sloop across the Atlantic. She weighed 70 tons, carried 8 guns and a crew of 46 pirates and was named Amity. He rounded the Cape of Good Hope and entered the Red Sea where he plundered Muslim shipping. Other pirates would follow in two's wake using Madagascar as a base and roving in the Red Sea and Indian Ocean. It gave rise to an incredibly lucrative trade network and the stories of such pirates as Henry Avery and William Kidd, but it has to be tackled in a separate video. Two himself was killed by a cannonball when pursuing a Mughal pilgrim ship. The Pirate Round, as this route was called, died down by the year 1700. Nostalgia revived it in the 1720s and one of the new sloops to enter Madagascar was the Dragon, commanded by Christopher Condent, alias Billy One Hand. He lost his arm in an accident and piracy allowed him to retire as a wealthy merchant. Despite the fortunes of these men, the size of a sloop limited a pirate's ambitions. The smaller size meant that you could carry less provisions, so you could either have a large crew and only sail shorter voyages, or sail longer voyages but have a small crew. The armament would always have been the same, light guns or swivels, unable to damage a proper ship. Steed Barnett made this mistake twice in his career, once engaging a Spanish man of war, then an armed merchant, twice forced to retreat. But his survival, though Pyrrhic, attests to the quality of the sloop. And a fleet of them could easily descend on larger vessels like a wolf pack. This is how Blackbeard captured the Queen Anne's Revenge. Indeed, sloops were often used as auxiliary vessels for large flagships. They could be used for scouting, chasing smaller targets, or carrying provisions and the sickly. And for most pirates, they didn't need anything larger. They had their base on some Caribbean island, cruised along the coasts, captured boats of a similar size, and made a good buck. But there is a reason why pirates in the open ocean preferred actual ships. Lastly, I'm doing an analysis of the sloop as featured in some select media. This isn't meant to bash on these games or anything, take it with a pinch of salt and think for yourself. I've never played Sea of Thieves myself, but I've looked at some screenshots and gameplay of the sloop. It has a single mast and a bowsprit and both seem placed correctly. The bow is also rounded and they have a figurehead but no head, which is weird. As far as I could gather it has two cannons which seem accurate for a sloop of this size. No swivel guns though, shame. It seems to have too high of a freeboard, like it's very high up in the water. Also the after castle is really weird, like you have a normal cabin with the helm on top, for some reason it has a wheel and not a tiller, which a small sloop like this would have had. The after castle then ends before the stern and is continued with a pavilion. Ships did have pavilions, you would have stretched a spare sail over the quarterdeck to give shade to the crew, but not like this. Speaking of sails, it has only a single broadsail, which is not how any sloop was rigged. At least at a headsail, and it needs a gaff sail to qualify as a sloop. I would have removed the broadsail, added a gaff sail, and then a single headsail. The sloop can only be handled by a single person, which for gameplay reasons seems reasonable. You probably should have gone with a piragua or masted canoe instead, but whatever. Historically, a sloop of this size could have been handled by four guys. Moving on to Sid Meier's Pirates. The sloop in this game is very well represented. It looks entirely historical. However, it is not correct for the time period. For one, sloops that looked anything like this may not have existed before 1680, and most of Sid Meier's Pirates take place before 1680. 1680 is like the last start date. It might also have too many sails. The sloop illustrations I have found from the late 17th century mostly have gaff sails and one or two headsails. The course and topsail seem an entirely 18th century thing. For most of the century they should have gone with the yacht instead. But I think the best solution would have been to change the rigging depending on the tier of the ship. Basically every ship in Sid Meier's Pirates has three basic tiers. Every tier gets increasingly larger and can carry more guns, men and cargo. So the basic sloop should have had only a gaff sail and two headsails. The sloop of war could have had a gaff, headsails and a main course. And the royal sloop could have had a gaff, three headsails, a main course and a topsail. If they ever remake this game or make a sequel, 
they should add ship customization. So you can take any hull type, modify it slightly, and then add whatever rigging you fancy. This seems most in line with the 17th century, when shipbuilding was kinda random. Again, if you want to acquire these games, I'd highly recommend you check out the link to Instant Gaming in the video description. You'll get a very nice discount. Moving on to some TV, Black Sails. I know that Benison Lil, who was the historical consultant on the show, was a bit pissed off over the sloops in this series. Basically, none of them looked like the archetypal sloop. They all seem to have two masts and are rigged like brigs, schooners, whatever. To me this doesn't seem too inaccurate. There were certainly American sloops rigged this way, and in Europe, a sloop could be basically anything. It just referred to the purpose of the ship. It's just a shame that they didn't include any actual sloops. After all, it was the pirates' favorite ship. Any of you so much as mentioned the Carter in association with the Golden Age of Piracy? All uh, that's not a sloop, that's actually a Carter. Huge thanks to my generous channel members and Patreon supporters. In particular, Cole Freer, Max Dweck, 1660, Michaela Jans, Daniel Stryker, Sea Dog, Randall Devere, Old Man Said, Krillov, and Nick Hooper. If you'd like to interact with me or fellow pirate enthusiasts, please check out the link to our Discord server in the video description. Hope to see you there. Cheers.